are poets also saddled with the responsibility of um, coining words, using words, old words in mm. new ways, defining yeah. old words, you know, That's giving it new meaning. That's what they must do. If they are, because look, nothing is new under the sun, yeah. right? <laughs> nothing is new. Uh, but isn't it, isn't it wonderful that invariably there are only about 25, 26 alphabets in every language, yeah. more or less, more or less, 26 alphabets representing the different sounds. And you combine them in all these many ways that we have these thousands and thousands of languages, including the ones that are already dead. You know. So it, it's the same thing. You have to be adding something new. And it is because by the different combination of the sounds, another word is created, another meaning is created. That's the same way the poet, even when he's writing about things that have been said before, says them in a new way, and by that way, has new meaning. You know. And society yes. just adopts it. Yes. I mean, death, love, hate, corruption, cruelty, you know, whatever it is, they have all been the rivers, the mountains, if they've been celebrated, they've been written about. But yet, new writers, new poets write about them, and we still want to read. Why? The stories of betrayal, uh, okay, the so-called romance stories, for instance. Let's mm. take uh, the romance stories. You know, uh, when I was in secondary school, it used to be for us the crime detection, you know, crime detective stories, you know, uh, thrillers. But uh, but but let's take the romance stories. It, sometimes you will know how the story is going to end. Those mills and boons kind of you know thing. You know how the story is going to end. But how the telling of it, the telling of it, she compares it to read. So if the writer makes you want to read after the first page, it means the writer is doing something you're interested in. It's creating a certain value for you. And it's all because of the way he or she has strung his or her words together to tell that same old story of A married B and then cheated on, on, on him and then the marriage broke up and whether they came together again or not, it's still an old story, but still it's new in this particular telling. Okay, That's so it. what's the most rewarding thing you get from writing? I think probably expression. Expression. We invented language. And we need, we express ourselves in it. And that's why freedom of expression is one of the basic fundamental rights of all societies that cherish, of all open societies. You have to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And because we live in society, and there are various views, there are many contending interpretations or understandings or ways of seeing about things, and on all the claims we make about who you can marry, where you can stay, how much to pay, you know, as taxes, you know, whether this road is going to be constructed or not, whether it should be dualized or not, you know, whether it should be a dam in uh, that river, and what it will mean for the ecosystem. There are so many vi claims out there. There are so many contending positions out there. And you want to have a, a say. And as a writer, you have the liberty of seemingly standing away from the fray, but still very much inserted in the fray. And because you have, the, if you're good at it, you have the gift of language, you can use it better than maybe your peers, then chances are your view is going to last longer. Even if you didn't win the debate at that point in time, it's going to last longer. Generations hence, they will still be reading it. We still all read things for that part. It was published in 1958. But that was one view on how a society should be, mm. should be seen. Okay. Those who were colonizing came and said, there's no history. There are no people there. They don't have a culture. They, in fact, they are inferior. They are subhuman. So we, can, we should colonize them. We should civilize them. And then uh, Mr. Achebe says, no. Before you came, we had a society. It had its own value system. This was the way it was. It may not have been as shiny and brilliant as, you, as yours, but it worked for us. And to demonstrate it, you see, the first part of things fall apart, you know, is how the society was before the arrival of the, of the, of the white man. Okay. You know, it has a justice system, it has a philosophical system, it has its own theory of war, what wars are good wars that you can fight, how to consult before, to justify that it's a good war before you go and fight it, and so on. Then the white man comes. Things begin to fall apart, right? Now, that view has lasted these many decades, and it's become, most people who don't know Nigeria, 
chances are they may have read this fall apart before mm -hmm. they will ever come to Nigeria. Or is their introduction to a sociology or a way of life in Africa, and by extension, the black world. Mm. So that's how powerful, that's how important. Just merely sitting down at a desk and, and expressing. writing and expressing yourself and give your own way of seeing the world. Okay. Be. All right. So for you, your satisfaction in writing is being being able to express yourself yes. having the privilege or the opportunity to say what you want to say yeah. but for some people their satisfaction may be people reading what they write about no we take that for granted if you publish if you if you wrote and didn't keep it in your drawer then i mean there's some satisfaction in it i mean there are people who do that and say it's therapeutic writing for instance you know uh, they are you write, nobody reads. Yeah, yeah, they are frustrated about something. You know, they are angry about their spouse, with their spouse, or something really terrible has happened. But Why don't you just put it in the diary or somewhere? Uh, but just writing too. You know, I found the diary form is also a literary form. The diary form is a, it's a literary form. It's been used all over epistolary, you know, uh, writing. It's, it's, it's everything writing. The, the moment you're dealing a language, and you're putting your words and publishing, or in a medium that can be published, you're writing. Now, uh, for some people, it may be uh, expectations of fame and perhaps fortune. You know. Now, definitely, if you're going to be a serious writer, you know, you're not going to. You, you, if you start off, I think you're going to be rich. Then you you probably should just throw away all your pencils and pens and your paper and go and do something else. You know, go and buy and sell, be a spare parts trader or you know distributor of you <laughs> know textile or whatever it is. But chances, are, but it can still happen that success smiles on you, even as a writer, most often late in life, and then you become famous. Or you could become famous without being rich. It can be any number of things, mm. you know. So that may be the primary uh, motivation for some people. But invariably, most of the serious writers I know, they don't go into writing because they're expecting to become famous and rich. Is the, what drives them? It's like an art, the artistic thing is, is you have to have a calling, you know. Uh, Wally Shoenka has a famous line in one of his uh, plays, uh, a ma in, I think it's in Death and the King's Horseman. A man is either born to his art or not, you know. You, are, you either have a calling, you feel something within you that wants to become an artist, a writer, a poet, a scholar, you know, a novelist, or you don't. Okay. Now, if you do, then you're primary motivation will be that uh, you're going to be rich, you're going to be famous, you're going to be known, but that you are giving expression to that thing with it's an urge. It's an urge. You simply have to give expression to it. Speaking of rewards, how financially rewarding is writing and poetry? Poetry? Not financially rewarding. That I can assure you. Are you kidding me? It won't pay your rent, believe me. All the poets I know, and again, I'll go back to that, some of the most of the serious writers I know have always had another job. In fact, the advice you give to everybody who comes to you say, I want to be a writer, a young person, you want to be a writer, get a day job. So that you don't start writing yes. for your frustrations yes. instead of concentrating on uh, social it, ills. It's something, it's something peculiar to the, to the arts. You also know about musicians who have their tales of how they struggled, you know, how they, uh, they, they skimped on meals, you know, how they shared uh, uh, ra uh, an apartment for with a friend and we're squatting and we're slumming it, you know. Uh, the art, there's something about the art because it, I guess the reason is that you have to prove yourself first. And in that time when you're doing your apprenticeship, when you're finding your voice, when you're, when you're laboring to produce that which the public will finally um, embrace and appreciate and be willing to reward it takes a while. Now, so is it climatic? Is it climatic? Is it peculiar to Nigeria or is it world over? I think it's world over. Really? Oh, you, you read the biographies of artists and writers. They are always at the beginning, they were always rough. And even some who we celebrate today never really live successful life. Van Gogh, out of frustration, cut his you know, ear off, you remember? Mm -hmm. you know? Now you go to a Van Gogh auction and then we sell one maybe millions of dollars, right? He never had those millions when he was alive, alive, you know. So you have writers who were really, you know, living in penurious, you know, situations, but we celebrate that today. So again, the reward 
what is a reward you know is it immediate material benefit money or that if you done this great work that everybody's going to be talking about you may not know it you know and that's also why for a lot of hard uh, to please critics some of the more conservative ones no artist reputation is firm until maybe some years after death so there has been a long time you know to see either reputation subsist if it stands you know there are some who believe that you know uh, so I, but i'm not uh, a believer in the dead poets and dead writers you know school that they had to be dead you mm. know before their reputation that are justly deserved in their lifetime but whether or not that comes with material benefit is another matter okay. i don't think that the show incas, the Achebes, and the clerks, you know, would have managed to live on their earnings, on royalties, on their writings, either way at the same time, holding down jobs in the universities as professors, mm. for instance. And um, may not be in the university, maybe working with a, uh, on a cultural magazine, a newspaper editor, or just writing for a newspaper. They do a lot of reviews, in fact. Uh, Salman Rushdie, for instance, did tons and tons of reviews you know so if it's, it's volume of uh, um, of what? essays called uh, uh, I think it's East and West and you know it's a compendium of some of those uh, articles so you see writers doing reviews for newspapers just to earn you know that little amount of money okay know, so, so I want to ask this question you know. now we are in a technological age where quite a number of things are done across the screen mm. right those days it was more, it was a function of you picking a book and reading. Mm -hmm. The reading culture, in your own opinion, has it gone up or it has gone down? If I go by the evidence of what I see in the newspapers today, then I would say we are becoming more and more illiterate. Literate? Illiterate. We are becoming more and more illiterate. And if you're more and more illiterate, it means you're reading less and less too. So it, you, would say, you would say the reading culture I is I would on say it could decline. be that, it could be that, that is in decline, or it's a product of many factors. But I guess what I'm, what, I, what I'm struck by is how much our use of English has degenerated. It's deplorable, actually. And it's everywhere, you know, in the newspapers, even editorials, you know. Editorials in those days used to be, the newspaper editorial, that was where you highlighted what the, the best writing, you know. You go for, went for the best writing in the editorial, you know. Non fussy, non bombastic, you know, the where where two words, that old dictum, where two words we where one word we we do, don't use two. You know, that's where you could go for examples of that. Then clarity, argument, persuasion. But what you see this, the writing is so sloppy everywhere and people even if they are spoken, you know, yes. uh, it's so sloppy. You know, I mean, we are talking about really things as primary, as basic, as tenses, as you know, as it's just awful. You know, so I don't know if that's a product of uh, steeply declining reading culture, or it's just the fact that our schools, our educational system, has gone to pot. You know, a long time. You know, and uh, uh, the teachers themselves actually need to be taught. They need to go back to school you know, themselves. I don't know where it starts. Okay, where so it ends, you know? on, on for the records now, as an authority in the writing um, medium, what would you prefer, what solutions would you prefer to that um, decline or um, gap in the reading culture and um, the writing and speaking skills that you have just highlighted that we lack? Our schools. Our schools. <laughs> Just like every sector, they are, they are in a very, very bad shape. If I, I remember at one point, there had been suggested that we should just shut down the universities and, you know, re, re, reorganize them, you know, and, and bring back the students when they are become proper places for learning, you know. Easy schools, easy schools, and again, homes. There are homes, for instance, where parents f pref uh, actually uh, frown on their children speaking their mother tongue. There's nothing as harmful as that, actually. Hmm. Experts have said that every child has the capacity to learn as many as five or six languages. You know, you know, growing up, as many as. So you you don't you don't have to worry. They are going to learn these languages. One is not going to be in the way of another, but we stop them. So the attitudes at home and the environment they are, they are, they have at home, 
and then from the schools, are those schools any good? Should they even, should they even be core schools? Should we send children there to be taught when perhaps those who are teaching them themselves need to go to school and be taught properly? You know? And then secondary schools, the universities. If we could have even that so-called folly standard of education in the late 70s and 80s, now today, our children will be better off. And, that, and we can have that for all the schools. I think our children will be better off. So I think it's the schools in the first place. So how many books do you have to your credit? I can see. At the moment, I have, I have the published three collections of poems, okay. each of which was a, a prize winner. You know, um, and then when you say prize winner, what kind of well, prize? Well, the Association of Nigerian Authors, you know, gives us these prizes in different in different genres. You know, okay. uh, drama, poetry, and uh, fiction. And uh, each of the years, when the my actually the first book won as a manuscript, that's something that Anna, the Association of Nigerian Authors, used to do to encourage uh, writers. writers. So you could submit a manuscript as as much as it would compete with even published books. So the year that I entered my manuscript of my first collection, it won, and I found uh, subsequently it was published. And part of the reason why Anna was doing that is also to draw attention to those winning manuscripts so that publishers will pick them up. And then I uh, have a second collection, and the first collection is called Homeland and Other Poems, and the second one is called Madiba, you know, and then the third one, The Oil Lamp, where, uh, which is a, a one poem book, in a sense, just entirely on the Niger Delta, you know. Uh, the uh, social, cultural, and political impact of um, the Niger Delta being the breadbasket of Nigeria, as you know, yet with all the things, all the ills associated with that, you know, gas flaring, all the social uh, communal disturbances, you know, the restiveness there by the youths, you know, and the people agitating for uh, a fair and equitable share of the resources and so on. So I just took a poetic, you know, uh, angle, uh, to it. angle to that. And then my which is probably my last, which is my last book, uh, my PhD dissertation at uh, Cornell, which uh, had been published, was published in 2013 by Paul Grave Macmillan in New York, which is this uh, book. Um, but at the moment I have five books in progress. I'm working on a, a book of short fiction, the spine of which is a novella, uh, and which I'm also having plans to begin to serialize you know, in the newspaper, because I think that is a good medium you know, yeah, for even serious, you know, fiction. For the past two and a half years, I've been writing a column every two weeks for Vanguard. But before then, I also be writing regularly, but not as a columnist. So I'm thinking of putting together some of the um, a volume of the essays, and then there's uh, my detention memoirs, you know, which is half done, and parts of which have even been published. But for some reason, uh, 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 a series sequence of events prevented me from actually completing it. So I'm also hoping to complete my detention memoirs. You know. hmm. So it, it would be nice for us to, you know, say goodbye to you on the program without you at least doing a poem or something for us, do something poetic for us before we leave. Okay, let before me... Before we close the show. I don't, I don't quite know which... I don't quite know which... But okay, I guess I will do a poem here that was given to me literally speaking, by the streets. I was coming from work one day from the Civil Liberties Organization. We see at our offices of, uh, uh, in Surulere, of uh, Laji Masha, you know. And right there at Adenero Gusonya uh, Junction, waiting for the traffic to change, um, the swarm of beggars just came around and were begging. You know, the, uh, I was in a minibus, and the bus was open, uh, the, the door was open. And then they, they started begging. And what follows is literally, a, I would say, a transcription of what took place, you know. So I call this poem, God Punish You, Lord mm. Lugard. God Punish You, Lord Lugard. The traffic warden's white and yellow sleeve stopped our transport. A Lagos minibus brought from one of the rust heaps of Europe part of the great scheme to gain reprieve for the city's long-suffering commuters. A horde of beggars swarmed the bus, 
He beat all to the vantage position in front of the open door. He had good manners. And what he lacked, such as the Queen's English, he faced with uncommon calm and courage. Blind and battered with a withered left arm, not for him, the plain and unlearned, help me for a chop, I beg, God go bless you. Some flourish or polish, he thought, would persuade far more than suffering's worst gown. And so he. Good day, brothers and sisters. Have mercy on me. Please have some party. Allah's peace for you. In the bus now, silence and private wars between purse and charity. Half your brother, have some party on me. The conductor, scorning all etiquette, laughed loud, pitying country, not beggar, and swore. God punish you, Lord Lugard. Now you bring this English, come Nigeria. The white and yellow arm beckoned the bus. A wild fury of horns startled it past, ferrying us beyond claims of charity and of Lugard's shadow in the black smoke. Hmm. What do I do or you want to hear another one? Just so mesmerized because, again, if you're not acquainted with words, you probably not be able to understand what has just been oh, read no, that, out. That's simple enough. It's just how history takes place, even in the streets. As I was telling you, we're running away from politics. It takes place in the streets everywhere. This is a bus conductor. This is just. I mean, if if you if you if you were if you were reading this to maybe a layman out there, they probably not understand all you have said. Apart from that, maybe God punish you. I mean, that's a very very popular regular balance here in Nigeria. Sometimes you have to employ some very very creative um, mediums like mm -hmm. language and like you said the readings and all. For some people. They may not be able to connect with you that very quickly. So how do you yeah. how do you how do you pass your messages on across to people who are in that well, frame? I mean, you you are you assume. I mean, every writer has an audience. Every artist has an audience. So you assume that whoever is coming to read a poem does have some the basic grounding in language to appreciate a poem. Now, it doesn't mean that every time you read a poem, even I now, I might read a poem and not understand it. And it may just be that the poem is just not a good poem to begin with. And or, because there's what's called the anti-poem. There are many movements in poetry, the anti-poem. They don't want to make sense. They want to make meaning. That's what they're about. You know, it's a kind of, uh, uh, what is that uh, uh, thing in Alice in Wonderland? You know, that uh, gobbledygook, you know, kind of, you know, kind of gobbledygook, you know, if you like. You know. But that's not the point. Anybody who has at least had a good secondary education can understand this poem. There's nothing difficult about it. It's a narrative, really, you know. You're talking about something that happened in the streets. W the context and the rhetorical devices used might be another thing. But they are not also, again, things that you have to have studied up on before you can understand what is going on. A beggar came to a boss, was begging. Nobody gave money, you know, and, and he's trying to speak English. Obviously, it's not educated. But he thinks that, oh, if I try to speak good English, then they may give me money, right? But then the thing that the Lugard coming in now touches an important part of our history. So anybody who knows our history, we merely connect with that. So God punish you, Lord Lugard. Ah, why Lugard? What's Lugard? So that is where, because every, every work should at least, every good work of art should at least give you something to think to, to about. Ponder, you know. It shouldn't all be out there, you know. You, you give you, so you think, you appreciate it. You say it gets you into the work, as it were, and makes you reflect a little bit. I don't mean any every philosophical thing, but just give you a little something. So on a final note, I mean, because we're running out of time now, <laughs> on a final note, now you're back. Um, you're back, and um, yes, you're a lawyer, you're a poet, you're a writer. Is there anything Nigerians should expect from your portal, apart from the books you have promised you, you would publish in time to come? Well, like I said earlier on, I. One of the reasons why I said to come to be more directly involved, as you might know, I actually sought unsuccessfully to run for the House of Representatives, to be a representative of the people. And my simple argument is this. If we all bemoan 
bad government and we say our leaders don't represent us, then we should, it, it means automatically we're feeling that we can do better, we can do a better job than those who are there. We will be more sincere, we will be more responsible, we will be more accountable, you know, we will actually do what the people want. So I wanted to use myself as a guinea pig. I actually used that term in an interview, in one of the interviews at the time, that I actually want to use myself as a, as a guinea pig. I want to see if when I get there, if I do get there, that sorcery that uh, lobotomizes automatically, you know, Nigerian leaders, as soon as they cross the portal uh, to, the, to their office and sit behind the desk, then something magically happens and they are, and they are transformed and they can no longer do what they promise they will do. They can no longer do those things that they always, we all know should be done, serve the people. I want to see if it happened to me. I want to see. You want to have a first hand yeah, yeah, experience. I want, to see, I want to see that magic transform so I become a thieving kleptomaniac, you know, I, because it's really, because it gets to a point where you wonder, what happens, you know, what happens? So why would you want to take the risk of being a watchdog that people know you for and respect you for, and then become a forerunner? Because we, people, if we think that good peop the people are there are not good, then we have to get good people there. So since every person must have a good opinion of him or herself, I happen to have a good opinion of myself, which is that I will do a better job. I will not be a thieving kleptomaniac, like I said. I will serve the people. So I want to go there and show that it is possible to be in government and serve, and, be, and serve the people rather than serve yourself. That's why. Okay. So what happened? So I lost, of course, you know. And this is where it becomes more interesting. It was a primary state. I lost to a 419er. Somebody was actually arrested two days before the primary. And on the, miraculously, in the afternoon of the primary, he comes in a convoy, police convoy. He was escorted in a police convoy, waving triumphantly um, from, a, from a, uh, a pickup uh, truck in the middle of the convoy. And he had made all kinds of promises to the people, you know, he was going to buy a car for every ward chairman, you know, who delivers the 26 votes in his ward. He was going to, all kinds of promises, outlandish promises. So when he was arrested, of course, they were dampened. But then when he rode in triumphantly in a police convoy, of course, that was the end of the election. So he won by a wide margin. Now the story doesn't end there. The day after he wins, he disappears from the constituency. He's not seen in the constituency again. And the party becomes desperate. I'm returning to the U.S. They call me and say, come back, come back. Your opponent, we can't see him. We're going to give you the ticket. Come back. <laughs> they invite me, I come back. But they had waited too long. The period for substitution of names at INEC had closed, so they couldn't manage to do it. But in the meantime, they made me to come back, start campaigning again. And people were ecstatic because I was back, you know. And all those who are there taking promises of money and all the, all the cars that were going to be given to them, who hadn't got them, you know, because he told them, said, look, they should just vote for him, that the money he has promised is coming in a billion van from Wari. The election took place in Ozoro. You know, if you know where Ozoro is in, where, in Soko, you know, consi federal constituency. And then that after the voting, they should just go with him to the neighboring town and he will give them the money. Of course, they didn't see him again. You know. so, so that is the, where our politics still, to, by and large, is, and we need to change that. Will that yeah. in any way change your decision? No, to no, no. I'm still going to stay. I'm still going to try to be involved and to be directly involved because, I mean, well, we have the example of Buhari now, who tried four times, right? Uh, it was only the fourth time. And there's even a more famous example of Abraham Lincoln, right? And the examples galore, you know. So it is not about uh, falling. It's about rising. Rising after fall. the fall. Yeah. All right. It's such a pleasure having you. You know, we could go on and on and on and on and on. But um, as, as it is, um, time is always of the essence. So I'm sure as time progresses, we would want to have records and uh, find out how far you have um, fared so far and the times you have them back. You so be happy to be back. So I'm sure you're married. Oh, that. yes, of course. You're married? <laughs> yes. Okay. With two children. With two kids. Yeah. So how's it like being uh, a father? I mean, this is a very, very <laughs> sharp <laughs> departure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were rounding up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
is this going to be a departure from? It's good. It's good. How's married life? It's good. It's good. Yeah. And the yeah, children, being a father. Lovely. Can't What's the difference between being a father, I, being a a civil liberty you to agent? You a lot of questions. You know. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you had to refer to look at homework. You know. You had to go to the the school events. You know. And on and on, you know, all the activities at school, you have to go to all of that. And birthdays, of course. As a village boy, I don't celebrate my birthday, but I have to celebrate my children. Has it changed you in any way, married life? I think every experience in life changes us. We may not be aware as it's happening, but if it's not, if it's, every experience in life changes us. So it definitely does change me. You know, you know. I can't be, for instance, as uh, carefree as I was when I was a student, you know, when I had no one to worry about other than my parents, you know, one of who was dead. Now, if I want to get into certain situations, I would definitely think, oh God, I have young children okay. somewhere, right? It doesn't mean I won't do it, but I will be more careful how I do it and, I will and think of other ways of doing the same thing, you know, and so on. So every situation in life changes, I think. You know. All right, uh, that's how far we can go tonight yeah. on Saturday night. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you on Saturday Same here. Yeah, that, that group again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we started with it and we're ending with it. Yes. So thank you so much. Yes. And so viewers on that note, we want to say thank you for staying tuned to this week's edition of Saturday Night. Until next week, like I always say, be kind to one another and stay well. <laughs>